So guys, after visiting a Tibetan hospital, a high school and a vocational school, do you think the Tibetan culture and the language are being preserved properly? What would you call China's approach culture in parallelism? I think the Tibetan culture is definitely being protected. I mean, we went into uh, high school and the kids were a little nervous. So they didn't want to ask us any questions. And so we said, why don't you sing a song? So like in normal high schools, the first girl who stood up sang BTS, the South Korean pop group, and that was a lot of fun. But then the second person stood up and said, I want to sing a Tibetan herdsman song. I want to show you my culture, my ethnic music. And he sang a great song and everybody cheered. And, you know, obviously that was a classroom that they weren't expecting us to come. We had like four different languages in four songs from that classroom. I was really impressed. You know, I, I think it's important for people to preserve their culture, but it's also important for them to progress and to grab opportunities, not only from within China, but from around the world. And that requires some knowledge. They, they're going to have to learn Mandarin Chinese to deal with the rest of China. They have to learn English probably to grab opportunities around the world. So I don't think there's a contradiction in preserving a, a culture of a relatively small group of people and knowing about the rest of the world. I, I don't think that's a contradiction. So I take that you guys don't think this is cultural imperialism? No, I don't see cultural imperialism. It's evolution, right? You're saying you've got to develop. You know, you can preserve and love your heritage, which we saw with people singing songs, but you also have to learn what's going to make you competitive in the next 50 years. I, I think too many people in the West look at Tibet as sort of noble savages. You know, it's the white man, you know, superiority complex saving, you know, the indigenous people. And they want the Tibetans to still have the same life that they had 70 years ago. But you know what? I don't think most Tibetans wanted that because they were serfs, their life was poor, and you know, they couldn't eat. You know, you need to think about development. And that's one of the problems that a lot of Western scholars who are so critical of the policies in Tibet are. I think it's unfair to restrict a child to only knowing about a limited culture. Even if it's his own culture, it's unfair to say, you're going to stay in this village forever, forever and you're only going to be able to understand Tibetan or whatever, and you're stuck with that. It's important that the child be able to make the choice and be able to take advantage of opportunities. That doesn't mean he throws away his Tibetan culture, but it means he can see the value of other cultures too. We spent a whole day in the schools and made friends with many Tibetan students. Sean, would you like to add a bit more on that experience? Yeah, it was really fun. I mean, we, I had three young, young men, you know, who were about 15, 16 years old, and they came up to me and we did a Douyin dance together um, because they were proud of just, you know, being global citizens. You know, one of the kids wanted to be a tour guide. He wanted to have um, Chinese from other provinces come and learn about Tibetan culture. The other two wanted to do Douyin videos and Douyin marketing, and that's why we did a little dance together. But I think the key was they all seemed happy and optimistic, and they looked just like school children in other cities in China and, you know what, other cities in the United States. What I really liked about the vocational training school that we went to is they were teaching, you know, how to cook. They were teaching Tonka, you know, traditional Chinese arts to try to preserve Tibetan culture. But they were also teaching advertising and drone making. And so it's empowering these teenagers to think, what can you be 10, 20 years from now? And a lot of them were graduating, um, you know, straight out of these high schools, earning five, six thousand RMB a month, which actually is a lot of money here. One more point along those lines. The economic development that's going on in Tibet allows them to preserve their culture. I mean, if you were an ambitious kid growing up and there was no economic development in Tibet, your only choice would be to leave and adapt to another culture. It's really important that they have opportunities here so they can grow and live a full life while preserving their local area and preserving their local culture. There's no contradiction between economic development and cultural protection. That's a great point because we, when the principal of some of the schools said to us that a lot of their students go to university and quite a few of them go to Tsinghua, Beida and the best schools in China. And when asked, do they stay in Beijing after they graduate? Actually, the principal said many of them actually come back to Tibet.
and they help do the economic development in their hometowns, but they also are able to preserve their local Tibetan heritage. It's actually the economy supporting their local culture, not that the economy diluting their culture. Now, their local culture, it can't stay stuck in the old primitive ways, but it's still the local culture. I mean, you're, you're not going to want to stay a serf, yeah. but you want to be able to take the best things about Tibetan culture and preserve it and also live a good life. Those are not contradictions. I think one of the keys on that, what David said, is you know, so many of the people who criticized China globally, who are ethnically Tibetans, were the nobles. You know, these were the people who had serfs and they weren't treating, you know, the everyday Tibetan very well. And so when they leave Tibet and they're now criticizing what's going on here, it's really selfish. And it's also only because they had a lot to lose. Exactly. They lost, you know, because they, they were oppressing others. They were rich and they lost that because the Tibetan government with Beijing's help, you know, made a better quality of life for the vast majority of people. But these people are very vocal, you know, in criticizing what's happening in Tibet, but they don't really know what's happening here. David, what do you see from all the young people in the schools? And I was impressed by the kids in both schools. In the vocational school, they were learning a skill that was gonna make them money. And they, they seemed to understand that at a very young age. So I, I think, I, I was amazingly impressed by how much these kids knew and how hardworking they were and how sort of dedicated they are to building their own futures. I also saw a lot of gender equality. Uh, so the, the ratio was not 50-50, you know, male-female in the schools yet. But what the teachers told me was that every year you're seeing more and more females who are getting educated. Mm -hmm. And I think that's something that, you know, the, the schools and the governments and the families should be proud of and because you're seeing Tibetan women and schoolgirls are becoming an integral part of local economies. They're not just housewives. Um, that, that was important.